So clearly when we are talking about the New Jerusalem, the metaphor of a city is used to describe a people. It's not so much a city as it is a people in an arrangement that is common to a city. Ancient cities were also people groups. Ancient cities were also an entire empire because it represented the dwelling place of a king. The word capital is derived from the Latin word caput, which means head. So to decapitate is to remove the head. A few years ago, I I made one of the trips to Rome that I did. Uh, But I also toured um, parts parts of Rome, I mean parts of Italy along the Adriatic coast, cities like the city of Bari and um, I was was a guest of a family in one of these cities and as I was leaving to go back to take the train back to Rome, um, an old woman, uh, really a matriarch of this family, asked me where I was going next and I said, well, I'm going to Rome. And she said, ah, caput mundo or caput mundi. I knew enough Latin to know. She was speaking in Italian, she was using essentially old Latin. Caput is head, mundi is the world. She said, you're going up to the capital of the world because for old Romans or for old Italians, Rome was still in their minds and in their historical perspective, Rome was still the capital of the world. Caput Mundo or Mundi. So where a king was, where a king resided, in whatever form that king may have been named, whether he was named um, an emperor, or a king, and Rome had both. Uh, The capital, the capital city was was usually viewed as the dwelling place of the king. Now, was the emphasis on the geographic location? No, it was about its political structure and its influence. In the ancient world, all roads, it was said, led to Rome because the concentration of the empire's power was was viewed as being within a city. Babylon is the same way. Babylon was indistinguishable from Nebuchadnezzar. It certainly was indistinguishable from Nebuchadnezzar in his own mind because as he walked about on the parapet of one of the levels, probably the top level of this great city and he surveyed the hanging gardens below him and the land as it stretched out and the fact that he had captured and brought back as slaves to Babylon people from the, from the known world at the time, he thought in his own pride that he was God. He even built a great image that his followers, his sycophants, persuaded him to believe 
was his, his own effigy. And he required everybody in Babylon at a certain hour of the day to bow down and worship this image. Daniel's, he had a vision about it as a great tree that the birds of the air came and animals came and gathered under the shade of it. And this great tree was cut down and in a stump remained that sprouted again after seven years. And you know Daniel interpreted that. I, not to go into that because it's not relevant to what we're saying, except that this is the relevant part. That ancient cities were synonymous with its kings and was actually a definition of the people. The people derived an identity from who their king was and the city in which they lived. So the word citizen is the Greek word polis, P-O-L-I-S. And in order to be a citizen, you had to be subject to a god or the god of that city, or if the city had multiple gods, those would be a citizen's gods. And the king would own all of the citizens. They would be his people, quite literally his people. That was not some sort of friendly nomenclature or social gesture of benevolence on the part of the king. They were actually his possession because he had the power of life and death over them. That's why he could order uh, certain ones to be summarily executed and there was no appeal from his judgment. That's why he had Daniel thrown into the lion's den in the case of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace. Because this was the understanding before there was such a thing as democracy and social orders like the right of appeal and so on. Against the king, there was no appeal because the king was the land and the people. That's the idea of an ancient city, that's the idea of an ancient kingdom. All the domains were ruled by the king. Now, what is the domain that was given to Jesus? What is the scope of the actual domain of his rule and who were given to him as subjects? Because that's who is assembled in this great city. That's why a city is a people. You see? In the second psalm, God said of Jesus, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Ask of me. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world for your possession. And concerning that grant of authority, Jesus confirmed that all authority in heaven and on earth was given to him. And on the basis of that, he commissioned his people, he commissioned the disciples to go into all the world, which is to say, as you go, as the Spirit leads you and you're going, according to your calling, according to your gifts, according to the destiny that has been laid out for you, as opposed to some church's idea of an evangelistic initiative. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. We just haven't believed it. The millennium is where he shows that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. We didn't believe him, I say we humans, didn't believe him because he was cut off in the middle of the week. He didn't get to finish his life on the earth. But the thing you must know about God is there's never going to be an unfinished promise. It may delay or be delayed 
but it will surely come to pass. And here, at the end of the time of man, here comes the time of the king, who is indistinguishable in the sense that a people through the period that precedes of a thousand years and the final destruction of any opposition and rule, to his rule and his authority, now he is king over the whole earth. Well, he was at the beginning of the millennium, but now the true nature of what is produced and what was meant to be produced by his rule, the glory of God covering the earth like the waters used to cover the sea, at this, because at this point there are no more seas, no more turbulence, no more separations between the nations. The glory of God has come into and among a people because this is like the anointing of Jesus, like the oil upon the head that flows down upon his shoulders, upon his beard, upon his vestments. All that he is, is reflected in all who have now made it through to the end of these matters. And, uh, and uh, his generations, because their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We had seen that from the end of the 20th chapter, where whosoever was not written in the Lamb's book of life, whosoever name was not written in the Lamb's book of life, was thrown into the lake of fire, which is, and we talked about that, I won't re revisit that now. But it's the ultimate destruction and removal from creation of everything in the sentient world that opposed the nature of Christ, to include absolutely humans and demons. An absolute total annihilation because they would exist without purpose in creation and there is no such thing in creation. And indeed, in a new heaven and a new earth, a configuration in which heaven and earth are conflated to reflect and to entertain the perfect hegemony, absolute rule and display of the great and great goodness of God and the great glory of God. This is what the new this is what the woman who is a city, who is a people, who is a king. This is what it's about. This is what it looks like. So let's continue to unpack it. Um, and we'll now focus on the 12 gates and a wall with 12 foundations. And angels at the gates. Let's look at these things. So it told us that there were three gates on each of the points of the compass. And these 12 names are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Why is that so? Well, to understand that, we really need to look also at the wall of the city that had 12 foundations. Because on those 12 foundations were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The gates represent the fathers. And we've seen from the principle of gates, as referenced from, from uh, Leviticus all the way through um, uh, Ezekiel, all the way through Ezra, all the way through Matthew. 
These represent a connection to the Father's house. So the promises that were once given and given to Abraham are now fulfilled in their entirety. And you notice that the names of these twelve fathers of Israel do not describe a city that is uniquely Jewish. It's called the New Jerusalem, just like these fathers are called by the twelve names of the twelve uh, of the twelve patriarchs, because the promises of God were always meant to be more than their physical antecedents. They referenced a spiritual reality that was established before the foundations of the world and therefore are intimately connected to the identity and the reality of a man in the image and likeness of God, spiritual man. So they survive, they survive the Old Testament, they survive the law, they survive human existence upon the earth because they're symbols of an eternal promise that God made and they represent the manner in which God fulfilled that promise by arranging a house in its final representation that harks back to the earliest symbolic reference to it that God deployed on the earth. That's how you have to see it. Don't keep taking the expanse of of things that I referred to as 4D and try to cram it back into and make it fit into 2D. If you do, you don't have enough room, you don't have enough space, you don't have enough understanding for there to be an accurate interpretation. You simply don't. Spiritual things contain natural things in their entirety but those natural things contained within the spiritual are meant to take on the volume, the mass, the the weight of spiritual things. If you view them only as natural things, twelve names, twelve fathers, twelve tribes of Israel, if you view it only as that, then you're locked in a box that has no answers for you. When God made a promise to Abraham, it was because God had already established a covenant with Himself that would allow God to produce on the earth through the seed of Abraham, first a Savior and then through the Savior to produce a holy people for His possession comprised of every tribe, tongue, language and nation. Now I know that there are those who are Judeocentric, meaning the only way they choose to see what the Scriptures say is through some interpretation of the uniqueness and the exclusivity of Israel at the center. Christ is at the center when you refer to him as Christ, you're not referring to him as a Jew or a Gentile, you're referring to him by his spiritual nomenclature, the sent one from God, the Son of God. If that's too much for you, then be an infant still because that's all you can be with that mindset. I'm just I'm not playing a game anymore if I ever played it. I'm a spokesman for the living God. That's what I will say. 
That's what I will do. That's my mandate. Whoever agrees with me, that's fine. I prefer you agree with me than not. If you disagree with me, then the one who sent me will establish whether or not I represented him. And I am good with that. I'm speaking in these blunt terms now and have been for some time because I have let go of trying to keep people from, the, from pursuing the folly of misguided notions and inaccurate understanding of Scripture, especially when such people are likely to turn and rend you. It's not self-preservation. It is very much identifying my purpose as closely aligned with the will of God as opposed to trying to persuade anybody who does not want to be persuaded. Now then, so the 12 names on the 12 gates remind us that when God established the first prototype of this reality in the earth, it was in fulfillment of a promise he made to Abraham. But that promise came out of a covenant he swore on oath to himself before the foundations of the world. So, in the end of the matter, which is where we are in the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter, speaking about a city, which is a people defined as a woman who is identified as a bride, who is subject to the sovereign king and carries the glory of God. I'm trying to unpack to you the mystery of why this is so so that you will not foolishly believe in a physical manifestation of what is spoken here, but see the much more complete and vast scope of the spiritual in which all that God ever agreed to do and swore on oath himself to do, he will have accomplished. And you, being the beneficial heir of such a thing, may prepare yourself as a bride will now prepare herself for the coming of the husband. For the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto, at that time, ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. This is the parable Jesus spoke to explain this principle to us. Matthew 25, five were wise, five were foolish, and so on. The names on the 12 gates signify, the names are the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. But what does that signify? They signify the promise, the promise that was given to their father Abraham. It also, by placing them in gates, it signifies the role of the fathers. Not the fathers now of Israel, but are not even individual fathers identified as Jewish or the sons of Abraham, but what they represent, the order of the arrangement of the house of God as a holy nation comprised of 12 because it is the number of government, 12 tribes. The principle was first established using the 12 sons of Jacob. This is not a Jewish kingdom. The fathers are not Jewish. 
This is the meaning of these things. It's the assembling of people behind their fathers as gates. Because it's a way to assemble a body that is also a nation, that is also a kingdom, so that every person is resourced fully to be and to become who they are in the most hospitable of arrangements, of relational arrangements. Otherwise, you're assuming God has no government and that the millennium is just a final, glad, happy collection of people who may breathe a collective sigh of relief that they made it this far. We're actually being set up for the age to come beyond that. And the harmony of being one body, functioning as one man, is what this is designed to teach. It is impossible for one body or many members to function as one body, all of them being unconnected individuals. That might fly in an American megachurch, but it has no future, has no relevance. Even now it has no relevance to the kingdom of God. What about the 12 foundations on which the wall sits that have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb? And do, do they indeed relate to the 12 gates which are described seamlessly as pearls which are naturally occurring gems? Whereas the others may be natural, the other stones have to be cut and polished. How do the two relate? The twelve foundations to the twelve gates, to a city that is twelve by twelve by twelve in length, width, and height by a thousand. So let's talk about that when I come back. I'm Sam Solon. I'll see you then. This mystery is delightful to the spirit of those who are just persons being made perfect to carry the light and the glory of God as we were designed to carry the light and glory of God as spirit men. For Zion, this great city, the dwelling place of the King. It's out of this that the glory of God shines forth to cover the whole earth. Let's have another discussion in due course. I'm Sam Solon and I'll see you then. Bye now. Grace and peace be with you always. Thank you for watching.